60 minutes from now. 60 well, minutes from now we will be done. Talking about Pollux 1 number 31. 1950, one of the official masterpieces of Western art. Robert Hughes, who you so much admire, put it. The first American artist to affect world art. It's like the middle of the 20th century, right. just after the war, America's taking over and you get that. something huge. It's a catalog of paintings. It's big, it's got a big engine in it, it plows through anything else. It's a cruiser of a painting, right? It's a high-class smoke. It's toasted. It's toasted. <laughs> you get Jack the Dripper. He needed not just to be another artist, but to be an artist who is dangerous and risky and American and powerful and macho. Being an original. Doing something no one else has done. In the language of American cinema, it's a big production. And we're the cast of thousands. It's meant for a cast of thousands of, of onlookers. Here we go. I actually have forgotten how much this looks like Warhol's piss paintings. Pollock didn't need a ladder to, to, to do it on. It's not quite as spontaneous as it looks. That is, just like everything else, just like really good prose, ours for example, right? It seems effortless. Now I had an interesting talk with the head of conservation and he pointed out not only the elaborateness of trying to basically sort of like conserve or fix a painting like this, also the imbrications, the accidents, the stuff that happened. Bugs, cigarette butts, dirt. How about politics, Christian? This is time of American hegemony. There's even the story of the CIA helping to support the spread of abstract expressionism. This is like the negative of one of those images of, of tracer fire in the sky over London. What they're clearly not is peaceful looking images. You feel the muscle, you feel the energy, you feel the splatter. But if we talk about splatter and splatter art these days, we think of pollen. The Pomo reading of a Pollock painting. We saw vaginas, endless penises, you know. Most postmodern approaches towards Pollock you know, tend to foreground the fact that he's a male, it's risible that he's a male, and it's risible that he's a male artist, and all this stuff is like risible, and it, de it, it, it deserves debunking. He uses Pollock as sort of like a, a bad- whipping boy. Yeah, exactly. Come shots, actually. Well, there you go. I now, I got you, now I got now you, you involved. Got now I got you involved. He is playing sort of a, a game with at least a couple of valences here, if we want to import the feminine and the masculine, right? There was a pretty fixed notions about the female and the male in art, out of art. And psychology. Yeah. Is it like a transgender painting? I think that that's nice. Like I, like, a, I like that. Yeah. Number one is transgendered, and I think that makes him really uncomfortable. He doesn't like getting in touch with his feminine side, but he, but he fingers it all the same. Well, and he knows that this is, he knows that he's making genteel, delicate, lacy art, and that's not acceptable. That's certainly not the public image that he wants to project. This is the moment of Freud, right? This is when Freud is at his I most do. important in culture. I doubt we're the first people to sort of come up with... <laughs> to see the vagina in the Pollock. To see the vagina in the Pollock. In a really early discussion about abstract expressionism among art historians in like 1950, 51, one of them was complaining that it looked too much like wallpaper, it looked too much like fabric. But it's slightly different in that it's the artist is a force of nature as wallpaper. The motif is nothing but the actual action of laying on the painting. The further we get back from it, we can take it all in at once. How does it sort of continue to collectively fascinate us? It kind of in a weird way gives us the finger. It doesn't have any of the normal things that are supposed to keep our attention, right? doesn't have subject, obviously, doesn't have focus in the composition, doesn't have any of the normal anchors. So it's kind of daring us to do what we're now doing. Oh, we've only got seven minutes left, so oh, good Lord. any smart ideas have to come now. So can, we, can we do it doing this kind of thing? Yeah, maybe we should turn on our... Have, we've never looked at this upside down standing on our heads. With Pollock, he was also straightjacketed by a certain far more public notion of what his paintings were about than he intended. This is the opposite of sort of the silence of Duchamp. There's no chess playing here, there's no calculation. So there was an Italian critic who said, it's just chaos, it's completely without form, it's completely without order. It would disturb too much for people to essentially want to picture themselves in front of it, right? You'd have to be explaining, what the hell is that behind you? In 1950, yeah, it yeah. would have made no sense. No, 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 no absolutely not. And, and again, going back to the idea of, of, a, of, of Pollock um, presenting us with revolutionary possibilities for painting and for art. I had somebody point out the October, mo the difference between the October moment and the November moment. You know, October in the, in the Russian Revolution is the month where everything happens and the boundaries explode. And November is this, the, the period in which things begin to constrict and actually begin to, to uh, formalize To come together, exactly. right. I think this is a November painting. It is a, a kind of desperate gallop into a dead end. Good, I think we're done.